Broadband is critical infrastructure. I've been the Arizona State Broadband Director for two years this month, and broadband is critical infrastructure was the first slide of my first presentation two years ago. This Shanae, is now can you, so can you pull up, uh, can you just put Jeff on the screen and get rid of everybody else? Yes, we're working on it. Okay. All right. That broadband is critical infrastructure is now self-evident to all of us. Two years later, after COVID, Americans now understand that broadband is the digital tissue that connects our jobs, schools, and medical facilities. Many jobs can now be done remotely. Distance learning has become a necessity and telemedicine is a vital solution in our overburdened healthcare system. These post COVID changes in our society have led to the realization that we have a digital divide in our state and in our country. This is a challenge for all of us, but one we can overcome by working together. This has been done before. In 1936, Congress passed the Rural Electrification Act, which was signed into law by President Roosevelt. We now have electricity in all but a few rural areas in the United States. In 1956, Congress passed the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, and President Eisenhower signed it into law. Now we can travel coast to coast on safe, efficient highways, interstate highways. The time has come for federal action on broadband and starting with the stimulus bill signed by President Trump and the executive action taken by President Biden to loosen up federal E-rate spending, we're off to a great start in 2021. In Arizona, we distributed $3 million in our rural broadband development grant. Three cities, Page, Payson, and Bullhead City, all have transform, transformational projects underway with this funding. We have four other communities who receive $50,000 planning grants, and all four are poised to use their plans to apply for state and federal grants to fund their broadband infrastructure. Bullhead City, one of our infrastructure grant winners that I just mentioned, has a broadband project underway with our local electric cooperative, Mojave Electric. Mojave Electric will deliver 10 gigabits to every address in Bullhead City. That's 10 times better than what you can get in Phoenix. Two lessons learned. Number one, if you have an electric co-op in your community, they need to be getting in the broadband business. And number two, there is no reason rural Arizona can't have the same level of broadband service as Maricopa County. As many of you are aware, we have $10 billion, excuse me, $10 million, gosh, I wish we did have $10 billion, <laughs> in rural broadband grant funding before the state legislature. And look forward to funding more great projects like Bullhead City, Page, and Payson. We're also partnering at the Arizona Commerce Authority with ADOT to build out conduit and fiber on our state highways. I-17 from Phoenix to Flagstaff and I-19 from Tucson to the Mexican border are moving forward. There's over $33 million for the western half of I-40 from Flagstaff to California in the proposed budget before our legislature today. This is open access conduit managed by our partners from our three state universities, the Sun Quarter Network, their broadband team. This infrastructure will benefit every city and town in the region and act as a digital foundation for our K-12 schools and our universities. This will also benefit economic development in each one of those communities. This is the foundation of our state's new broadband infrastructure. I'm excited to announce that the Arizona Commerce Authority has received a grant from the Economic Development Administration, the EDA, one of our co-hosts to hire a consulting firm and develop a statewide middle mile plan. This plan will be focused on connecting every population center in Arizona back to Phoenix. This plan will be the foundation that everything that comes out next. We have a plan in the pipeline. There are over $2 billion in broadband funding from our partners on the call today and other federal agencies. 
Now we need you. The seminar, this seminar's series will lay the foundation for what comes next. Don't just attend, participate. Take this information and use it in your communities. Let's get this done, Arizona. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christine Firethunder. I'm half Navajo and half Hopi, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here and talk to you a little bit more about broadband. And thank you to Jeff and Karen for joining me and allowing me to give this um, brief comments here. So over the course of the pandemic, I think we've all understood the challenges that had been presented to tribes, especially since we weren't prepared for the great impact that COVID has had on us. Um, we've had some challenges in getting in touch with our community members and enforcing those ways to keep yourself and your family safe and finding ways to get our youth to have access to broadband. And we've seen how some of those things have been challenging for our little ones and just getting access to technology and um, making some of those hard decisions to actually go outside and sit next to the school rather than be somewhere safe and warm in their own homes. So this is an opportunity for us in partnership with other entities. And I'm sure that those of you who've been working on this for a long time have been attending the tribal broadband summits um, and all the efforts that the Department of Interior and the BIA have made to close the digital divide. So for some of the tribes, they've been able to leverage the CARES Act fund and make those strides. But there's still other tribes out there who haven't had the opportunity to get that started and now is that opportunity. We're hoping that this discussions and future opportunities will make broadband development less burdensome, not just for the tribes, but all your community members. So what are the implications for broadband in terms of tribes? So it will enhance social opportunities, cultural understandings, and not to mention uh, stimulate our economic well-being. Through leveraging technology, it gives an opportunity to improve healthcare outcomes through telemedicine. Um, I'm sure for anyone who has been participating in these discussions, you'll understand that healthcare access has been limited and far reaching for many of our tribal community members. This is a chance to increase economic development for our Artesians or other small business owners who live in tribal lands to access a global marketplace and perhaps even start their own storefront on Etsy or some other uh, online venue. And let's not forget that this is an opportunity to increase um, community engagement. Those situations where we're constantly talking about cultural per preservation and understanding a language where we might not have an opportunity to meet um, in our own traditional territories, this is a place that we can do those things remotely. And not to mention expanding our ed educational opportunities to perhaps attend a school across the country just by broadband. So again, thank you for being here. We're grateful for your participation and we look forward to participating um, with you through this transformational experience. Thank you, Christine. All right. So we have a very exciting group here today. Um, we're gonna go ahead and kick off the next uh, phase of our program. Uh, here's a, a quick rundown of the various programs as you see coming up. As you can see, the, the programs do build upon each other uh, and it is a process. And I highly suggest you attend all or as many as you possibly can, including our breakout sessions in the two off weeks. So. What I'd like to introduce next is Scott Woods. Scott is the manager for broadband technical assistance at Broadband USA. Broadband USA is part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, and Scott is responsible for $1.5 billion. Yes, that's with a B uh, in broadband funding this year. Uh, working very hard uh, around the country and we're very grateful to have Scott here in Arizona. And we look forward to uh, hearing what he has to say about Broadband USA and what's going on with our federal government in 2021 with broadband. 
Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate those kind words as we kick off and welcome everyone. Uh, again, we're excited to be here uh, with Arizona uh, as part of our broadband workshops and our partners, our federal partners with EDA uh, and USDA. I want to acknowledge them and all the hard work that they've been doing. Uh, they've been a great partner along with uh, the state of Arizona and Jeff with your leadership with, uh, with the broadband office there. So thank you. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. And the next one after that. <clears throat> and back one. <laughs> so, there we go. So again, just a really briefly about uh, my team. Uh, you've seen uh, Karen Archer Perry, who's a senior policy analyst uh, with Broadband USA. Uh, she's been coordinating a lot with our federal partners. She joins us with just an illustrious background, uh, both at the FCC and the Gates Foundation, as well as in uh, the service uh, provider industry, and she's an engineer by trade, and, uh, and I want to thank Karen and for all of her work and her efforts. You will hear from her throughout the day as she was a co-host with me, <clears throat> as well as uh, on the data section uh, of, of our talk. Uh, also, we have Don Williams, Dr. Don Williams, who will be joining us tomorrow, and he'll be with us at the end of the day just to give a brief uh, intro to uh, introduction on broadband planning uh, from the community perspective, how to develop a team, how to really get started with the identification of some very important issues and stakeholders in your community. Uh, Don joins us with, again, a wealth of experience. Um, he served as a, a broadband consultant uh, for a number of years prior to joining NTIA. Um, and again, he uh, primarily works with communities, local governments, uh, tribal governments as well uh, throughout uh, his, his time here at, at Broadband USA. Um, and we'll go to the next slide, please. And you'll hear from us uh, throughout these uh, events as we move forward. Next slide. Really briefly before we get started, <clears throat> I just want to tell you just a little bit about NTIA, who we are and what we do. Um, it's, it's a lot, it's the alphabet suit, if you will, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. We advise the executive branch on uh, both domestic and international telecommunications policy issues, really around three core you know, objectives, right? Expanding broadband access and adoption, expanding the use of federal spectrum, and then ensuring that the internet remains an engine for continued innovation and economic growth. And it's that goal and that aim of which we've really established these Broadband USA technical assistance workshops and our work with communities, local governments, and service providers across the country. Next slide, please. And so again, as, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of our Broadband USA efforts, really three pillars, right? Educate, assist, and convene. You know, we educate, you know, arming the right uh, stakeholders and community uh, leaders with that they need that will help them make the right decisions for their communities, right? We assist by doing things just like we're doing now, right? Holding workshops, you know, uh, convening with the federal uh, agency partners. You know, we advance events that really uh, lead to better conversations and shared of lessons learned, both on the federal level and in the community. <clears throat> and then convening, you know, we provide direct technical assistance to a number of different partners that seek planning, funding, and implementation assistance. So obviously pre-COVID, we were on the road. We love to travel. We love to meet in the community. We love to meet, um, you know, with uh, folks on the ground. Post-COVID, you know, we've shifted to uh, the virtual environment. And again, with that comes some technical challenges. So again, we do appreciate um, everyone's understanding and their, and their patience. Uh, we look forward to the opportunity to be able to do this again in person. Uh, and hopefully towards the end of this program and platform, we'll be able to do something as a wrap up uh, uh, for the state of Arizona. So stay tuned for that. Next slide, please. Um, and again, you know, the theme is we focus on community outcomes, right? Partnerships, either with federal agency partners, as Jeff mentioned, you know, he's a key member of our state broadband leaders network. Um, it's now made up of, of 50 states and six territories of broadband directors and leaders that come together to share best practices. Uh, we improve coordination amongst our federal partners, USDA, EDA, you know, FCC, and a number of other uh, Department of Education. We're always involved to ensure 
that broadband is at the front of, uh, of those, those policies on the federal level. And, and very briefly, technical assistance, as I, I told you, you know, we really focus on a lot of different things. Data analysis and mapping is really big. You know, digital inclusion, adoption, and digital equity. Of course, infrastructure. Uh, but again, you can't really focus on one. These all three things, things work together. Infrastructure, digital inclusion, analysis, and mapping. Um, and we really are, are a, a bedrock of how you get started. So don't feel like you have to figure all of this out on your own. We're here to help. The state of Arizona is here to help, uh, and we'll, we will all work together, including our other federal partners that are here, um, to really help you get started. And then finally, our products and events. You know, if you go to our, our website, we have uh, guidance and tools. Those of you who've been able to participate on our monthly webinars, uh, and again, our national broadband availability map, which is a big uh, event, a product that we have now that really shares uh, broadband uh, data on a more granular level to help federal and state policymakers make better informed investment decisions. Uh, so we look forward to uh, utilizing the MBAM in your efforts as well. Next slide, please. And so as Jeff mentioned, I think everyone has known the, the, the worst kept secret now is that the NTIA has been granted uh, through congressional authorization, you know, almost $1.6 billion uh, to, to establish three new grant programs, right? $1 billion for tribal broadband uh, connectivity grant program, 300 million for broadband infrastructure deployment grant program, and 285 million for connecting minority communities pilot program. Um, so we're working through uh, all of those. If you, we have an event coming up on March 17th. Uh, it's a webinar series or uh, the first of our series of webinars that are really talking about these three, our uh, NTIA's responsibility under these and kind of where we are in the process. These are three new gr uh, broadband grant programs. Uh, so for those of you who go back to the BTOP days, they're, they're similar. Uh, but again, have totally different uh, frameworks and focus. So uh, we'll be updating the community on where we are and, and when we can expect to, to launch these, uh, these very important programs. So stay tuned. Next slide, please. So what I'm going to do right now is really take you through some of a broadband basics, right? So it's an overview of the information of terms and phrases, I think, that we all need to understand to establish that fundamental baseline understanding of broadband terms, issues, and networks. So that when you do go out in the community and you're talking either with local service providers or even amongst yourselves, uh, we have a rudimentary understanding of what we're talking about, these various technical terms that, that we use. Next slide, please. So first and foremost, what is broadband, right? Fundamental question, broadband refers to high-speed internet access. Again, that is always on and is significantly faster than traditional dial-up access, right? Don't laugh, because I'm sure you all know there are communities, including some that are represented here on, on this webinar, um, that still have uh, dial-up access, right? Uh, but there are various uh, modes and modems of, of transmission technologies and in broadband, including fiber optic, wireless, uh, DSL, and coaxial cable. We'll do a short overview just so we understand what we're talking about with respect to those modes of transmission for, uh, for broadband. Right now, the FCC defines uh, high-speed broadband internet access as at least 25 megabits uh, download and upload of at least three megabits. So, uh, and that's for, for the FCC. And we can talk about what's best for your community as we move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, again, under the theme of broadband, you know, FCC has created a, a national broadband plan and, and broadband goals. Uh, they created the plan in 20, 20, 2010, excuse me, for the goals for 2020. So it was a 10 year plan. Uh, goal number one was at least 100 million U.S. households or homes would have uh, access to affordable uh, download speeds of at least 100 megs per second and upload speeds of at least 50 megs per second. Uh, another goal we want to highlight is goal number four, where every American community uh, should have affordable access to at least one gig of broadband service to anchor institutions such as your schools, hospitals, libraries, uh, and government facilities. So we can discuss where we are with respect to those goals here in 2021. <laughs> Next slide, please. 
so again, when we're talking about from a community perspective, right, broadband speeds are very important when sending, uh, uploading information if you're a business uh, and receiving information download if you're an end user, right? So we're always talking about upload speeds. That's the speed at which a system sends data to a remote server, right? When you click it and upload reports, upload crop reports, up, upload crop analyses if you're in, in agriculture, um, if you're uploading you know, large reports for uh, business systems, business analysis, analysis you know, that requires you know, robust upload speeds. Download speeds are really end user based. That's the speed at which the system receives data from a remote system, usually an end user device, a computer or laptop, uh, downloading Netflix, downloading uh, information, uh, pictures, you know, accessing information uh, from uh, from dish, additional uh, entertainment sources. You know, that's typically your, your download speeds. Next slide, please. You know, we talk about several key terms um, generally in the industry when we're referencing or discussing broadband networks. Again, we gave you an overview of speed. You know, generally that's the pace in which data can pass through a network connection, uh, generally measured by megs or megabits per second. Uh, from a, a service provider standpoint or, or, or the uh, availability or viability of the network, we talk about bandwidth, right? That capacity or maximum amount of data that can pass through a network connection at any given time, right? We used to call it, you know, how, how much data can pass through the pipe, if you will. Uh, latency is a technical term, but that's really a delay between an end user's request for data, i.e. the click of the mouse or click of the web page and the delivery of that data, i.e. the website accessibility, right? Various different transmission technologies have very different latency uh, performance details and you need to understand those as we move forward. And then finally, reliability. That's the industry and FCC standard. That's the consistency and predictability at which broadband service is provided. Uh, and for most, if not many, if not all of broadband service providers, uh, always here to what we call a five nine level of service. And that is that broadband or those telecommunication services, you know, much must be on available, reliable, no downtime, you know, 99.99999% of the time. Uh, that's a very high standard for, for reliability. Next slide, please. So for the purposes of this discussion and what's most important to you uh, there in the community is what is your baseline broadband speed evaluation, right? There are some typical checkpoints that we already know. COVID-19 has just revealed how important these, uh, these matters are, right? Everyone knows that fast, reliable internet is vital for communities to fully participate in the economy, right? But do you really know what speed you have and what speed that you need? and understand that very different broadband technologies have very different speeds and capabilities, right? And more technically, you know, the speeds requirement are based on the activity that you're doing, the location you are, uh, meaning how many miles uh, you are away from the facility, and again, the number of users that are on the network or the system at any given time. <clears throat> if you go to our website, we have, again, oh, prompting our products, uh, we have some recommendations, if you will, uh, for what speed that you need uh, for some baseline activities, right? You can see home, you know, at least the, you know, the high, the broadband standard, excuse me, is 25 megabits per second, right? But if you're a small business, now you need more uh, connectivity, 50 megabits uh, plus. Uh, again, these are download speeds. We know now that the upload speeds are, are also important as well. So, if you go to our website, you can find all of this information, but it gives you some baseline recommendations of, you know, what speed do you need depending on the activity or entity uh, that you are. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to pause right now. I'm going to ask Karen Perry to join us, and we're going to ask you to conduct a, a speed test on uh, whatever device or computer that you're using right now, and then use your uh, the chat room to share your test result. Uh, location uh, and the technology that you are connecting to. So again, yeah, this is an inform informative session, interactive, gets us an opportunity to really see the type of, of speeds that you have uh, and that you're working with right now. So if you can take that time, uh, you put that in the chat, you click it, you run the test, and then uh, we'll, we'll be able to review the results here in the chat in just a second. So thank you very much.
Yes, I was talking on mute. I'm going to get that on a t-shirt and I'm going to sell it. You're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> My entrepreneurial uh, request for uh, 2021. Um, we're starting to get uh, feedback. Can everybody can everybody see the feedback that's in the chat? Um, yeah, if you just select the chat button down on the bottom, the, the dialogue box should pop up and you're able to see other responses. So we're getting some good responses here right now. We got we got some people that have uh, some very reasonable. Oh, oh. <laughs> spoke too soon. <laughs> we spoke too soon. Very good. <clears throat> so it, it's really interesting to see the variability. Um, and I find a lot of variability even in my house. So in theory, I, I have cable and I pay for 700 megs down but I only get 20 megs up. And uh, I was trying to watch a streaming service last night and I couldn't even run a speed test. My service was so slow. So, um, so we've got huge range. So five meg down in, in vert, um, it's going so fast I can't read it. Getting some fairly good speeds, yes, and some not so good speeds, which I think can shows, uh, <clears throat> you know, shows the, the variability uh, and the variance between the the attendees. And we also see um, a lot of these asymmetrical speeds, and, absolutely. Um, and I think that um, people, a lot of people, have said that um, download speeds are for are for consumer culture, and upload speeds are much more for producer culture. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Scott? Yeah, absolutely. As we showed in the previous slides, you know, for those of us who, who, who download and access, you know, primarily for entertainment purposes, I always use the phrase, you know, streaming services and, and, and Netflix and, you know, end user stuff where we're just getting, you know, providing information or getting information, excuse me, from, uh, from a third party. Um, but if you're running a business, you know, or, entrepreneurial or otherwise, there, there's a significant requirement for upload capability, um, for reports, for data, um, you know, for communication communication with staff that's in the field. You know, if you're in the agriculture sector, you know, you have to upload all of these fairly sophisticated crop reports that, uh, crop analyses that actually require a, a, a data intensive, there are a lot. And that's not even to mention, you know, telemedicine and telehealth purposes, um, that require both, you know, symmetrical um, upload and download. So, um, you know, there is a various uh, a difference. And now that our schools, both K through 12 and post-secondary schools and colleges are virtual platforms, um, you know, you have to have the ability not only to access that information, but also to upload information to um, the teachers and, and, and professors. So uh, the, the needs are, 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 are growing, if, if not by the day, uh, definitely by the month, as, as we've seen through this, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Feel free to keep adding uh, speed test information uh, as you continue here. I got to tell you, we're actually going to kind of come back to this data off and on throughout this workshop series, because there's so many different places where this can play into your planning and your strategy work. But um, turn it back to Scott to continue. And before we do that, we have a, a, a question from one of our attendees. So M Melissa Boydston would like to ask a question. Um, Melissa, can you unmute yourself and just ask your question real quick and then we'll get we'll we'll jump back into the presentation. Or you can type it in the chat if you feel more comfortable asking it through the chat and we'll make sure to circle back and, and get to it. You also did get a question about when Arizona might have access to the national broadband availability map. Oh, I asked that. Sorry, I didn't see that question again. I was I was focused on this comment that says, of course, people who attend this webinar 
are self-selected for having good broadband connection. That's not true, but uh, we understand the sentiment there. Um, so the NBAM is actually a closed portal. It's going to be used for uh, federal and state policymakers. So, so you know, presumably Jeff and, and the Arizona uh, Department of Commerce as, as a member uh, would have access to it to better inform investment decisions here in, uh, in Arizona. Uh, we're working to uh, increase some functionality to create some reports and dashboards um, for uh, perhaps some public use in the future. But right now uh, that MBAM is a closed platform uh, for uh, federal policymakers, federal agencies, and our state partners. And again, as of now, we have 30 states that are on board the NBAM, uh, including their data and access to uh, the NBAM data, which includes some proprietary uh, private data sets. Uh, but again, uh, as we move forward this in the future, you know, the goal is to make uh, more of this information both transparent and, and accessible. So, uh, Stay with us and, and we're doing our best to make sure we can uh, provide the public exactly the, the information that they need. In terms of the um, self-selecting for good broadband, I, I still remember when we offered this workshop at East Carroll Parish, Louisiana, every time we did the speed test, uh, Linda Milton would, would, would do the speed test and she'd say, nope, I only have three meg today, only have 1.5 today. She had the worst broadband of anybody, but uh, always got, you know, I can't even get the speed test result today. So it isn't that people self-select self -select for good, band, good, band, good broadband. Lots of times they self-select for bad broadband. Yeah. Uh, it's usually uh, all across the map. So yeah. um, we do understand that there is a significant digital divide between those who have access um, not just from a broadband infrastructure and speed, a speed standpoint, uh, but also from uh, a utilization, uh, use utilization training. Um, and so we, we do understand that and we'll have a session just on that as we move forward. Again, we'll make the, these are recorded. Um, and so we try to, to get all of this information to as many uh, of underserved and unserved uh, communities that, that we can, including unfortunately before COVID, you know, actually going out uh, to those communities that do not have the capability to join a, a presentation or a webinar like this. So um, that is a good point from uh, one of the attendees. So, all right, so let's transition back to, again, thank you everyone for your responses. We're gonna transition back into uh, the presentation. And so, you know, again, uh, we have some speed test notes here. Again, everyone will have access to this presentation. Uh, be emailed out. Uh, and so we have some notes here just on uh, how to run effective speed tests and some things to note uh, about the, your results and what impacts those results. So let's continue moving forward. Next slide, please. All right, so we're going to spend a little bit of time here, um, and I'm going to wrap up here shortly, just on broadband network architecture. So really understanding, uh, you know, the infrastructure that's available from the service provision, service delivery standpoint. You often hear uh, folks talk about backbone, right? That's the major high-speed transmission lines that link smaller networks across the country. Um, there are literally millions and millions of miles of backbone between the East Coast and the West, West Coast. Um, they generally link up in urban centers like Phoenix uh, that all provide the public facing uh, access to the internet. Uh, <clears throat> there's also middle mile, right? That's connection between the backbone network and, and local networks. Uh, again, uh, in, in rural areas, middle mile infrastructure, middle mile development uh, is, is, is key, is a key component to ensuring um, access to broadband robust infrastructure. And then we all hear about last mile, right? That is that connection, that direct connection between that local network and specific end user homes and businesses. Again, in rural areas, that last mile component is the key. Um, that's what's lacking. That is what uh, impacts our underserved and unserved designations uh, in those communities. The next slide, please. So I'm going to just give a, a really brief overview of those uh, different types of uh, transmission technologies. Uh, we all understand about, about fiber. Uh, this is no in no particular order or rank. Uh, fiber, it, generally, it 
fiber optic transmission uh, transmits data over light. Uh, it's a really astounding uh, technology. If you get to break it down, get to see it. But there are really two main types of uh, deployment types of fiber. Fiber, you see it in aerial or you can see it buried, right? Aerial is usually deployed over existing pole, utility pole infrastructure. Um, again, there's maintenance costs to that because they are more exposed to elements of nature. It's usually more cost effective to deploy a fiber network aerially. Uh, but it's really better suited for areas that uh, are not hit with extreme weather, tornadoes, hurricanes, um, you know, floods, but there are, you know, succumb to uh, man-made accidents and fiber cuts as well. And then buried fiber, you know, again, the installation are, are, are generally installed in conduit underground. A little bit more difficult to repair, well, more sophistication because you need fiber splicers and uh, and other work categories, but the repairs are less frequent uh, because that fiber is buried and protected in, in conduit. Uh, typically, it's more expensive to de deploy uh, buried fiber, uh, but may be suited, and not maybe, it is better suited for areas with extreme weather. Um, and, and we can provide examples of that. Uh, next slide, please. Those of you, um, the majority of the country and majority of the, our homes and residences are connected through copper-based technologies, uh, infrastructure deployed by, you know, legacy cable and telephone operators, right? So there's coaxial cable, uh, originally installed, installed for cable TV systems. It's right now, it's the dominant technology, means the number of, of homes that are served or deployed for residential broadband services, uh, but that service is not symmetrical with both fast download and, 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 and fast upload. It's typically fast download and, and, and a slower upload. Uh, and then for those of, of you who may still have a digital subscriber line or DSL services um, over the legacy telephone systems, um, you know that's traditionally over the copper-based telephone networks, can't match the speeds of other technologies. Uh, and then depending on how uh, far you are from those facilities, the speeds degrade rapidly over long distances. So the further you're away from that DSL facility, uh, the more impacted, the more slow, if you will, uh, your speed uh, of your, your network connection will be. Next slide, please. So we talk about wireless. Uh, again, wireless technology uses uh, directional equipment to provide service over a wide area. Again, you see this in suburban areas and rural areas, uh, and there are a number of different types. There's fixed, right, wire, fixed wireless, uh, where wireless devices or systems provide services in direct fixed locations. Uh, we're all under, we are all aware of mobile uh, technology, right? Cellular network uh, delivers services to mobile end users through smartphones and other devices. You know, everyone talks about 5G deployment and, you know, primarily the urban areas, uh, but they'd be surprised there are some areas of the country um, that don't even have uh, 4G service. Uh, you are still on 2G um, and, and less network uh, uh, speeds and capabilities. So, uh, again, we can talk about that later. Uh, satellite, there have been a, a ton of developments in satellite technology where geostationary satellites provide service in primarily low density areas and rural areas. Uh, but again, uh, that technology um, is improving now yearly uh, in terms of the development and the speed requirements and the latency addresses of some of the technology in satellite. Uh, and then finally, microwave, which uh, microwave technology has been around for a while. It's mid to high frequency wireless signals that deliver service between line of sight locations. So they're good um, you know, systems in, in flat lands, but to the extent that there's foliage, there's blockage, there's uh, mountainous terrains, again, because of the point to point characteristics, you know, microwave uh, may not be the best uh, uh, solution to deploy in those type of environments. So next slide, please. So again, this is just a graphic picture of the different technology types. And we've all seen these before, you know, riding around, driving around our communities. You know, you've seen the cell towers with the equipment on it, uh, both the drums and the, the, the mobile uh, service equipment. 
uh, LTE and five uh, 5G equipment uh, if you're so uh, inclined to have that service. Uh, but also I, I like to point out, and I always laugh about this because I've been in a few of these, you know, you'll drive around the interstate system and intrastate a highway system and you'll see these, you know, really ugly looking, you know, brown monoclad buildings that are strategically deployed along the highway system. Well, inside those very ugly buildings are millions and millions of dollars of communications equipment, uh, really quite sophisticated how they aggregate traffic across all of the various types of, of, of network technology. So again, they look ugly on the outside, but on the inside, uh, there are millions of dollars worth of uh, optical equipment and broadband service equipment and cable and all kind of uh, uh, equipment in there that uh, that powers and transmits and aggregates all of our, our internet service and broadband and communications traffic. Uh, so again, you come back to this, you can see the various different types of, of connection technologies, transmission technologies, uh, again, um, that it shows this just graphically. Uh, the next slide, please, and I'll begin to wrap this up in a second. So what does this all mean, right? The question that we always get is, why are you doing all this, right? Right, we know why, right? COVID has exposed, you know, massive gaps in uh, digital equity and health, uh, in education, and the ability to access, you know, various different information and resources, right? So our goal here is to establish a connected community, the utopian community of no matter where you are, no matter where you're located, no matter what you do, you know, you have access to information, you have access that impacts you uh, to be able to be productive, right? To be able to participate fully in the digital economy that we know that we're growing into, not just nationally, but now globally, right? And so we have some phrases down here that may resonate with some of you, depending on whether, you know, you're an entrepreneur or home-based business or Main Street business or uh, whatever, right? If you're a business or government entity, you know, you're really worried about resiliency and continuity of activities, right? Broadband directly impacts that. All right, for students, you know, we always talk about education, right? COVID-19, we know about health and uh, telemedicine and telehealth applications, particularly with um, the advancements in the vaccine and vaccine hesitancy. Uh, you know, again, a lot of public health departments are, are signing up folks using, uh, you know, you know web-based technology. So again, we're concerned about digital equity, the ability to access uh, uh, vaccines, the, the ability to access telemedicine and, and telehealth. Uh, for service providers, right? If I'm a local government, I'm looking about economic development, right? Making sure that my workforce, uh, my, my, the workforce that I'm responsible for cultivating uh, remains competitive and I can bring in new challenging businesses uh, for, my, for my workers, regardless of whether I live in a rural area, in an urban area or anywhere in between. Uh, so again, the developments in smart technology, smart grid, um, you know, smart city, uh, smart state activities, uh, these all drive productivity. And again, the ability that no matter where you are, no matter who you are, um, you have access to information to access not only goods and services, but to be able to, um, to, be able to foster innovation and creativity um, for all of us. So next slide. So that is the idea that we're working with. Uh, it's my, my pleasure right now to uh, to introduce Karen Archer Perry again, who's a senior policy analyst with Broadband USA. Um, and she's going to walk through some examples of economic development, uh, including we have an upcoming panel about local economic development in Arizona that we hope that you find very informative. So with that said, Karen, I will turn it over to you. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to address you today. Thank you very much, Scott. So um, obviously, uh, the reason you build the network is not for the purpose of a network, but because the broadband network is the foundation for economic development, for community connections, and for building really all of the things that are important in communities. Um, when we do workshops, one of the things we start with is what's important in your community and what does broadband have to do with it? And when people develop their community vision, almost always broadband has something to do with it. And uh, one of the worksheets that we'll talk about when we talk about your community uh, regional workshops is uh, community priorities and what does broadband have to do with it. 
and they're almost always related. The um, next slide. So what I'm gonna do here in this presentation is just talk about a little bit of the data um, that is related to the economics of broadband um, and why broadband matters. Um, we know that broadband transforms, sustains, and connects communities. Next slide. Uh, and so I wanna just highlight some of the recent data that kind of goes behind that. Um, a recent Pew study that was really done prior to the pandemic um, indicated that six in 10 students um, use the internet to do their homework every day. Now we know now that almost all students use the homework, use the internet to do their homework every day. You might think that every student uses the homework to do, use the, uses the internet to do their homework every day, but unfortunately they don't. There's a big disadvantage for students who don't have the internet. 64% um, of students who have no home internet access leave a portion of their homework unfinished. And um, a, a, a major study done, done by the Quello Institute in partnership with the University of Michigan found that students who had no internet access spent on average 30 minutes a day extra in doing their homework every night. And I know that I've seen articles in the paper recently about students who have to, you know, drive their car places or sit in, sit in parking lots in order to get internet access right now in order to do their homework. So internet access used to be about a homework gap and now it's even more about a learning gap. So it's become even more significant than it was before. Next slide. That same study done by the University of Michigan and the Quello Institute also found that internet access was related not just to the ability to do your homework, but it was also related to the outcomes in your education. So it's worth about a half a letter grade. So the difference between a B and a B plus. A different study also found that internet access had a direct correlation in how people felt about their studies. So in an elementary school study, people found that internet access had something to do with people's, with students' um, sense of how they felt about their learning because it uh, contributed to um, using technology for collaboration as a favorite learning method. And again, that Quello study found that students without digital access were lacking those basic digital skills that they needed to um, be motivated to advance to any post-secondary education, whether that was a trade school or to college or any further education at all. Next slide. And those basic technical skills are needed for just about any job right now. So 77% of all jobs require technical skills. And most of us now are using our technical skills in order to be online. So it's hard to say how many people are online doing work right now, but uh, a study by Gallup um, found that in early, early in the coronavirus pandemic, 62% of people who were employed were working from home, which was double the amount of people who were working from home the previous month. Next slide. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics um, has a book called they, that they call the Occupational Outlook Handbook, which identifies kind of the outlook for different types of jobs. And they clearly say that technical skills are important for jobs. Um, if you've got a computer or technology experience, you're going to make a lot more money. So 89K is the median income for somebody with computer and tech skills which is double the median income for somebody without it, that's 39K. But you don't need to have a bachelor's degree in computer science to make 89K. Um, if you've got a high school degree and you're a telecom line installer, um, you're, you can make 65K and they're, in 2019, they were projecting 200,000 of those jobs. And that was before we were talking about all this stimulus money out there. So there are plenty of line, line installer jobs right now. And part of the legislation that people are talking about in Congress is additional training for more line installers. And again, that's a job that requires high school education. So there's plenty of opportunities um, in the tech field 
um, at any end of that spectrum. Next slide. Uh, broadband definitely transformed business. This is really a hard one to measure. Um, a study by Deloitte and Google um, indicated that digitally advanced small businesses earned twice as much per revenue and were three times as likely to create jobs. Um, and then a study by NTCA, which is the organization that represents rural telephone companies, indicated that for every job, for every job created by a small telephone company, there were two additional jobs created in the community by that job. And that's certainly easy to believe that telecom jobs create other jobs. Next slide. Um, the US Chamber, oh. did we just jump to? Yeah, there it is. Um, the US Chamber of uh, Commerce uh, Technology Division also did a study uh, that said that the gross sales in rural small businesses um, would increase 20% over three years, representing billions and billions of dollars with lots and lots of jobs um, if technology was increased in those businesses. Next slide. I think precision agriculture is one of the more exciting ones. And the USDA did a massive report on this uh, last year. They uh, determined through that study that through increased use of uh, precision agriculture and digitization through farms, there was economic benefits of about 18% overall um, in those farms. And that comes from reducing water use, reducing chemical use, um, better fuel uh, use, um, uh, more precision use of, um, of seeds. And then the end result is that you get better crop yields, um, you have a greener farm. So it's really a, kind of a, like a triple play win across the spectrum. Um, so the benefits in precision agriculture uh, really just go completely across the board. More money, more green, better output. It's a wonderful story. Next slide. Um, this is sort of a wrap one with a couple of additional statistics. Um, in terms of some community benefits, we're finding that three quarters of the forms that people get from the federal government, they now get online. Um, it's hard to even measure how much telehealth visits have increased. Um, one study we found um, indicated that uh, they've increased 154% in March of this year. I think they've increased even more than that. Um, broadband access can increase your home values by 3.1%. I still think it's more than that, but that's the most recent data that I can find on it. And um, next slide. In order to try to kind of match this to the previous analysis we talked about, we put a, a speed simulator on our website and Shmay's gonna pull that up for us. What the speed simulator does is it looks at various simple applications and it looks at how long it would take to upload or download a file um, depending on the speed of your connection. So if you think about the previous speed test that we did, and now you imagine that you had 20 customers on your Wi-Fi network, and um, Shmay is going to hit start. And if you had that 50 meg connection, you get a feeling as to how long that, how long it's going to take to either upload or download traffic. Um, if you had 20, 20 customers on your Wi-Fi um, network. So if you've got that one mega, megabit connection, you're still waiting, still waiting, still waiting, still waiting. Whereas if you've got that gigabit connection, you know, you were on to other business a long time ago. And so when you're setting broadband goals for your community, um, you have to hit reset before you do it again, Shanae. Um, if, you're setting, um, if you're setting broadband goals for your community, um, this might be a tool that you can use to kind of demonstrate the impact of higher or lower broadband speeds 
um, at the same time that you're also thinking about the applications that are driving income, revenue, and experience in your community. That's the last thing we wanted to leave you with before we invited you to take a five minute break and then come back to our panel. Jeff, did you wanna say anything before we moved into our five minute break? No, thank you very much, uh, Karen and, and Scott. This has been, been really good. I think it's important that we all uh, understand where our, our federal partners are coming from and how they look at the world in terms of broadband. I think that we're in a position right now uh, to, to do some great work with these folks. Uh, so please take a break and, and come on back. We're gonna have some local examples from here in Arizona, from different industries to talk about broadband and uh, to give you some local color on what we're doing. Thanks. Uh, today's session uh, is almost two hours.
right, hopefully everyone is back uh, from the uh, trip to the refrigerator and um, ready to get started with our panel, which I think will be, will be interesting uh, and informative. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, please. We've got uh, four gentlemen on our panel who are, are very well known uh, in their industry here in Arizona, who, who also uh, have had some extensive dealings with broadband specific to their industry. Uh, Stan Goligowski uh, from the Yavapai County ESA in education. Uh, Colonel Frank Milstead, uh, our returnal, retired uh, Colonel from Arizona from the DPS, the, our state police. Uh, Toby Cotter, uh, the city manager from Bullhead City. Uh, and location of one of our most exciting broadband projects. And Mark Smith, the president of Smith Farms. Uh, if you had lettuce yesterday, it probably came from Mark's or, or one of his neighbor's farms out in Yuma, Arizona. So we're excited to get going here and uh, let's go ahead and bring up our panel. Um, let's see here. Stan, are you with us? I sure am, Jeff. All right. Hey, thank you so much for making the time to be here with us. Um, as I said, what Stan has done in Yavapai County with our schools is a great blueprint for other rural school districts. We give him an opportunity to speak about it. And at the conclusion of all four of our speakers, uh, you're welcome to, to ask questions about uh, what they've done and, 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 uh, and see if it applies to where you are in Arizona. So go ahead and take it away, Stan. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so Jeff uh, asked me to talk about what we did in Yavapai County to really tackle our broadband issues um, for a location that really is the size of the state of New Jersey, um, landmass wise. And there's just lots of different geographical issues uh, from mountainous terrain down to the desert and uh, off the uh, interstate. And, and uh, as you can imagine, um, you know, just very extensive. I came back here, I grew up here in the um, in Yavapai County in the Prescott area. Um, and then I spent 21 years on active duty in the army and then moved right back here uh, and worked, started working for Yavapai County. What I found working in, in my job for the, for the Yavapai County School Superintendent's Office, uh, when I was given the, the challenge to figure out what's going on with with our schools and our libraries uh, for technology, mainly driven by standardized testing that was gonna be all online at the time in 2014. Um, it was how do we get all of our schools online and have the capacity to even hold these, these types of exams um, from the smallest school to the largest school. And we're talking from three students up in Crown King, Arizona, uh, to about 4,500 students in, um, in the Prescott Valley area. So, so <laughs> to be honest with you, I was, I was surprised that certain locations had worse uh, broadband speeds than, than in a combat outpost that I served in in Afghanistan. I mean, it's, it was unbelievable how, <laughs> how, uh, how different it was. And honestly, what it came down to is what I, what I discovered is there are carriers that weren't, it really wasn't cost effective for them to punch lines, fiber lines, satellite, whatever it, it was uh, into these locations because there wasn't gonna be enough uh, economic return on the company if they were to build out to these locations. We use the example of Congress Elementary School, which is about an hour north of, of, um, of I guess, Scottsdale, Wickenburg area. Um, and a, for a teacher to download a YouTube video, they'd have to wait for the end of the day, uh, start the, the download when nobody was in school and in the morning it would download and they could show that one video. Um, so that's kind of what we were building off of. Um, so what we discovered is with all of the different locations that we have here, we have over 50 schools, uh, districts and charter schools in Yavapai County. If we band together as one entity, then we could, we could go to a carrier and say this broad, all of these different customers can pay for the broadband 
um, what would it cost? Well, you can imagine that this, this cost is going to be astronomical. So for several years, we just try to get the rates down on each individual carrier in, in each location. Until the education superhighway came about about five years ago. Um, and we noticed what they were doing in states like Montana and Texas in particular. Uh, there was E-rate funding offered through the Federal Corporation uh, Communication Commission that they said they were going to end. We they could use they could for eighty percent of the costs they would provide eighty percent of the costs for a build out free of charge essentially to schools and libraries um, if the state would kick in ten percent then they would kick in the additional ten uh, then the additional ten percent. So we approached the Arizona Corporation Commission and we found the funding for that 10%. Um, so even on everybody's phone bill, there was a couple cents on every phone bill that was charged for about a year that gave us that 10%. And that was for all of Arizona. Well, we gambled on it. We gambled that the funding would be available, that our project would be approved by the FCC and E-rates. And the gamble, the gamble um, obviously turned out in our favor. Um, and what we did is we put a we put it out to bid to all these different carriers. How can they get to all these different locations? So there was there was roughly 80 locations in our county. That and what would it look like? Uh, we were looking for a fiber build. Well, what we discovered is. This was the one opportunity for these carriers to get into remote communities that they normally wouldn't be able to get to without coming out of their own pocket to get in there. So they saw an opportunity. And just as an example, well, we got 74 of those locations built up. It took us about three years. And we're talking about locations they just finished in Crown King, uh, which is way up in the Bradshaw Mountains. There are three students there they can get 100 megabits per second in that location. We were dealing with 1.5 megabits as a maximum in that location. And that's the way it was in most of those different remote locations. So, so even here's another example about how this, this leverage for the lines uh, really worked out. Uh, our own sheriff's office weren't able to get uh, body cameras because they couldn't download the body cameras when they went back to their different substations. Well, the lines that ran through all these different remote locations ran right by these substations. And because of that, they were then able to purchase the, uh, the body cameras. So that really spoke to the safety of not only their officers, but to the public. Um, so by leveraging that, they saw that schools as a community anchor institution could be the one entity that can provide broadband for these locations. You know, the whole time we, we viewed this as, you know, this is a utility, just like plumbing, electricity, <laughs> anything else. Why can't we get it into these areas? Well, um, that's, you know, that, that is the dilemma uh, that we're facing, but the only way we could do that, honestly, is by banding together. So we formed a, cons a consortium that's comprised of, of schools, libraries, our colleges, uh, a lot of IT uh, individuals, just very smart um, and hard charging uh, individuals. And that's really the only way that we were able to get it done. Now, now that we have the, uh, the consortium in place, we just tackle different projects. Wes Brownfield in particular, I know he's on here with the Arizona Schools, uh, Rural Schools Association. You know, we're, we're working on, in partnership with him for that final mile. And we know that there's funding that just got, uh, that was uh, made available through the FCC um, related to the E-rate, but we're gonna, we're gonna tackle that final mile now. And the only way we can do that is through, through us being together as a consortium. So that's what we did up here. Hey, fantastic, Stan. Great story, great results. Um, and I think the key, the key uh, takeaway for me was this is a consortium. These were a lot of different folks coming together 
to make this happen uh, for Yavapai County. Uh, and again, what you all did up there and what the, the town of Payson did really were the models for our broadband action teams and a lot of what we're doing in Arizona. So thanks. All righty. So next up, we have Colonel Frank Milstead, who is our retired uh, DPS leader. Uh, Frank was also the uh, police chief of Mesa, if I remember correctly. And he's going to talk a little bit about uh, broadband and law enforcement and some of the, uh, the things that he has seen and expects to see. So Colonel Milstead, are you with us? I am. Hey, thank you so much, Jeff, for having me. Uh, just a real quick uh, background. Uh, 35 years in law enforcement. I did 25 at Phoenix PD, and then I was the chief of police on Mesa, Arizona for five years. And then after that, uh, I was a Ducey appointee and worked for Governor Ducey as the uh, colonel uh, for the Arizona Department of Public Safety. And one of the biggest challenges in any of these communities uh, or any of these departments is communication. How do you keep uh, law enforcement uh, in connection with each other and with uh, the community. Uh, the real challenge came uh, at DPS where probably only about 55, 58% of the state had uh, true uh, land mobile radio coverage. Uh, there's uh, The rest of the state uh, troopers could not re reach one another. They couldn't speak um, with uh, the dispatch. Nobody knew where they were. So the dispatchers were good at gleaning a lot of information from the call that came in and, and had a lot of information in case something went wrong. But if it went wrong, it went wrong fast and they were alone. Um, is the, the other challenge you see now is um, how do we build out broadband so we can use that uh, for LMR, land mobile radio, to uh, long-term evolution communication with the uh, ISI interfaces and things like that. And we've been doing that up in uh, Page, Arizona, uh, up around um, uh, Canyon de Chez. Um, it allows the officers to use that ISSI to communicate from a, a cellular device uh, through a broadband. So there's any time that we spend money building out broadband in the state of Arizona, you're actually adding RF coverage for law enforcement. The other thing that's coming very rapidly over the next number of years is going to be what we refer to as next generation 911 calling. And that's gonna allow you to be geolocated with next gen 911, uh, text messaging 911 uh, information to um, public safety, uh, mm -hmm. connecting police and fire. And then the, and without broadband technology uh, in those rural areas, that won't happen and it won't be available. Uh, the next piece of it, as we've seen, and it's changed a little bit uh, over the last 12 months because of COVID and, and people not actually being in school, but school safety has become a huge issue, not only for law enforcement, but for all of our, com our com uh, community members. Uh, and in every state in the nation, school violence was a big deal. And, and how do we take uh, rural schools that are remote, that are not uh, able to connect with their local law enforcement, because uh, they don't have that connectivity through broadband and how do you build that out? Um, so what, what is one of those solutions? And that is um, finding technology that is not only reasonable and, and, and very robust, but you can, be a, you can afford to put it in. And that's one of the jobs that I've taken now as a consultant for the digital decision. Um, is helping communities. We're in Canton, Ohio right now. We are in uh, Louisville, Kentucky in the Russell neighborhood, building out these, um, these excluded communities or uh, just, you know, kind of uh, edge communities and giving them that broadband technology that they need uh, using white fiber technology uh, to build a true 5G mesh network that has, has edge sensors, uses Zigbee um, uh, transmission, and on edge technology with, uh, it'll do gunshot detection, uh, atmospheric conditions, cameras, uh, sound, lighting, and it gives community safety. It gives the officers that connected officer to the, to the, to the actual community itself. They can, they can reach them. They can know what's going on. Um, and it also brings to, to bear what uh, Stan said a little bit about downloading of information from body cameras. Um, all of us uh, are moving towards more and more body cameras with uh, law enforcement. Um, in Arizona, with the Arizona Department of Public Safety, that is the biggest challenge. There's a 100-camera uh, or 150-camera pilot program going on. And how do troopers download that camera information at the end of the day that don't go to a station? How do they do that from the remote housing? Or when they do get to a station that's in a remote part of the state, 
do we have the broadband uh, technology? Do we have the bandwidth to actually download those documents? And one of the things that I did as the director, I always sent out videos uh, to keep people apprised of what's going on to hear from the director himself. And they, a lot of times they couldn't even watch that at the station. They had to go somewhere and watch it on their phone. So this is great for law enforcement. It's great for public safety, police, fire, schools, uh, and it gets us all connected back. And there's an there's a inexpensive way to do it without trenching uh, new fiber. And, um, and we're here to help and to solve that problem. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Colonel Wellstad. I appreciate your time uh, and your service for our state. Um, we are uh, excited also to bring on uh, Toby Cotter. Uh, Toby is our city manager out in Bullhead City. Bullhead City, uh, the city in Arizona will have the best broadband in the state of Arizona here shortly. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the area, it's strategically located between Phoenix and Las Vegas on the Arizona New Mexico, or excuse me, Nevada border. Uh, and I'm very excited to hear about the project and, and specifically around economic development related to this uh, impressive build. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Toby Cotter, city manager in Bullhead City. Uh, so we've got about 42,000 residents and we've been able to partner with our electric co-op here, Mojave Electric Co-op, which was formed way before Bullhead City became a city in 1984. So the electric co-op really was the foundational cooperative um, in our community. But I would challenge everyone to think beyond the co-op, if you will. Um, we also have Suddenlink, who's a major cable provider, provides broadband services along with Frontier. We also have a local mom and pop uh, business called uh, Tri-State Wi-Fi. So our residents are served, but we get many, many complaints from our residents come to the call to the public at our council meetings and there's always someone complaining about their broadband. So over the past few years, the electric co-op has applied for grants and has really started this process of what can we do to make it better in Bullhead City? And so that's kind of the why. Quick story and then tell you and tell my government partners what they can do. So we have this need. There's over 6,000 homes that have already signed up. MEC is about 34,000. They are going to provide fiber to every single home in their cooperative. That means over 34,000 fiber connections. So you can imagine what Bullhead City looks like right now. Some of it's overhead, a lot of it's underground. So we've got like four different construction crews all over the community. The first member, I'm hoping it's City Hall, uh, will be signed up in April. So that's when we'll have our success stories moving from Frontier, from Suddenlink to uh, our electric co-op who's partnered with TWN as the provider, uh, all of it will be owned by MEC. So they're investing $110 million in the Bullhead City area in fiber. And, and I want to make it clear, fiber to every home. Even if you don't want to subscribe and you're happy with Frontier or Suddenlink, you're going to have fiber to your home. That's what they're doing. That's the connectivity that we'll have. And I pulled the data from their website. The plans are there. Um, you can sign up as soon as it's available. So to get the one gig, and that's dedicated up and down one gig to your home. And I remember Scott telling all of us earlier in his presentation, he wants to get one gig to schools and hospitals. Well, we'll have it to every single home in Bullhead City, one gig dedicated up and down for $119. If you go that route, no, not every home needs that. Certainly if it's a couple people with a few devices, so the 25 meg will be 49.95 a month. And so they started to talk to the city about that really seriously just in October as they applied for grants, received grants. And so there's the, there's the hook. And I think the important part, my takeaway from this presentation is as a government bureaucrat, city manager, um, you know, we can throw up roadblocks. Um, they're using our rights of ways. They're in our easements, construction galore going on. Uh, we do not have a franchise agreement or a license agreement to do this. This is being done on a handshake in good faith to bring our community the best fiber in the state. So our commitment between myself, uh, along with the mayor and city council, and our electric co-op, which could, quite frankly, be any electric company in this state, to move quickly, to move faster, so that we all can enjoy the telehealth, telemedicine, school, connectivity that we need and the, the, you know, the connectivity our businesses want and desire, we signed a simple letter back in October that says, 
we will have an agreement in the future, but we want you to move forward. We want you to move forward now. Now, do you trust a private company like Suddenlink or Frontier or Cox or someone to do that? I don't know. That's up to you in your own community, but you're not going to get it in the next year or two if there are a bunch of legal uh, roadblocks put up by your city attorney. And so that's where we got to that point. Now we have people and new businesses moving to Bullhead City. Over 500 new homes have been built in the last 18 months with many new homes and subdivisions being planned here. Companies from California moving here, um, some that we're working with today. And so as we work on that, the main question is, are you in Arizona, not in California, of course. But the second question is connectivity. We have people moving here now and working in California, mostly Southern California, because of our broadband fiber and our uh, you know, dual connectivity. And with this on the horizon, starting in April, we are absolutely going to be leading the state in connectivity and we will continue to grow because of our partnership on fiber. Thank you, Toby. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. I, I think that there's a, a few key points that, that I take away from the Bullhead City uh, example and, and what Toby has said. Um, number one, if you have a rural electric cooperative in your town, uh, you need to go to those meetings and talk to them about getting into the broadband business. Uh, I was on a call yesterday with other folks from NTIA and they were talking about the success in Mississippi they've had with, with rural electric cooperatives. Uh, this is something we need in Arizona in those communities. And uh, I will say that that uh, th so far, so good. I mean, so far, so excellent, I should say, on Mojave Electric. They've done a great job, and they're a great role model for folks that want to get into that, into that business. All right. So next up, we've got Mark Smith. Uh, Mark is, our, is the president of Smith Farms. Uh, Mark has taught me more about broadband and agriculture uh, in the last couple of years than uh, I have learned in my entire life. Um, I've actually had the opportunity to go out with Mark on his farm, uh, trudge around in the mud, follow my butt a few times, uh, and get an understanding of what we're dealing with in terms of scale. Uh, there's a lot of land in agriculture, and there are things like rain and dust that affect wireless signals. Um, so Mark has been one of the leaders of the Broadband Action Team in Utah, excuse me, in, in Yuma, and uh, we're moving forward with that progress, and, and I'm very optimistic about what we're going to do in Yuma uh, in the next two years. Mark, please feel free to, to get started. All right. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how Jeff gets me into these situations. Uh, but I want to start off here uh, a couple of things different than the other presenters here. I am not uh, part of a government agency. I'm kind of representing the, the business side of uh, this broadband, uh, broadband challenges. And so uh, I kind of got involved in the broadband uh, challenge about four years ago because of lack of capacity for our agriculture business. So start off a little bit about my background. As Jeff pointed out, I'm the president of Smith Farms. We're a local farming operation in Yuma, Arizona, and we grow winter vegetables. And for, uh, I think a lot of you know from Arizona, but for others, uh, Yuma area grows about 85% of the winter leafy green vegetables for the United States and Canada. So we are agriculture system here is, you know, uh, is critical to this nation. Uh, we grow the product from middle of November to the middle of April. So if you're getting a leafy green vegetable anywhere in the United States, there's a pretty good chance it's coming out of Yuma, Arizona. So it's an important uh, agriculture system here in Yuma. And uh, because it is a, a high value crop, we do use a lot of technology in our industry here and in our tractors uh, you know are all self-guided gps guided we use uh, sensor technology uh, we'll be moving into robotics and ai and all of those require high uh, high connectivity rates and good broadband services and the current uh, technologies out there, you know, the wireless systems, the Verizon systems that can't support that. If you're going to be using AI and you're going to be using robotics and self-driving uh, equipment, you have to have a good solid connection, high-speed broadband, uh, because most of the AI stuff will be working off the cloud and that requires, uh, you know, good broadband services. So as, a, as an industry that's 65% of the economy of the Yuma area, 
uh, it's important that we get broadband services in Yuma. Historically, our broadband services have been uh, you know, very low, uh, much like much of the rural air parts of the state. Although Yuma has, is a community of about 250,000 people, we, can, we still get classified as rural in a lot of respects. And, and so we've had, uh, we've struggled with getting uh, our broadband services here. And like a lot of the rural parts of Arizona, we have a, the metro area, the city of Yuma, and then of course we have the city of San Luis, city of Somerton, and then the city of Welton. Uh, that are, and then you have Yuma County, the unincorporated areas. Uh, and we have some primary carriers here. Of course, we have the, uh, the cell phone systems, and then we have uh, one cable system, and then, uh, and then one fiber system here. But they don't cover the entire areas, and, that, and there's where our problem uh, lies, is, is there are certain parts of the area that have decent broadband services, then a good amount of the rural areas do not with no access to it. So as uh, Toby pointed out, you know, the importance of having broadband to your entire community is imperative. One of the things that we've run into as we've tried to uh, work on our brand, broadband services, a lot of the grants work really well for the schools and for the law enforcement and for the government agencies. And that offloads uh, a good amount of the uh, demand. And then it becomes less uh, economically viable for a provider to bring in services to other parts of the area. So that's a challenge that we've been faced with. And because the agriculture areas are not densely populated, uh, you run into a, uh, an ROI of their uh, investment in their asset. So that, that is our challenge that we're dealing with, not only in the agriculture area, but in the uh, unincorporated areas that are not necessarily sparsely populated, they're fairly densely populated, but they, they choose not to wanna to service them. So in the Yuma area, not only are we working uh, for the agriculture side of it, but all the support industry that supports agriculture is the business side of it. Plus, uh, as they pointed out, the education side of it for all the homes that are in the rural areas that have little or no broadband services. Verizon did a study early on uh, when we work on uh, improving their services that they had 25% of our students in the area had no connectivity at all. And not poor connectivity, no connectivity. So you can see what kind of impacts that has on your community, your education system, you can spend all you want getting uh, high broadband to your schools, but when they go home to their homework, they can't do it. So uh, that's that's been a major issue for the Yuma area is try to improve our services, not just for our uh, schools and government facilities, but to try to improve our services for the entire community. And I think everyone needs to really uh, focus on that because a lot of the grants do just focus on the government facilities, but you need to focus on your entire communities uh, so that your businesses prosper and your students can prosper and your entire community can prosper. And I know in some, one of, in some of our broadband meetings, they say, well, we just can't afford that. Well, I am here to tell you, you can't afford, you cannot not afford to uh, get broadband services to your entire community because if your businesses don't prosper and your students don't prosper, then your community's not gonna prosper. So I just want to, uh, when, you know, our federal partners here, when you're talking about your grants, we need to be able to look at uh, some of the areas that your ROI is not really there, but you need to service it because, it, it, you know, we have an industry that does service the entire nation, but you will never have an ROI that will exactly fit the model of, of these grants to make them work. So again, uh, as we look at these broadband, you know, do think big, Think of a back, you know, we're looking at a backbone to try to uh, to uh, service our area so that at some point everyone would have access to it. And if there's not a backbone out there, you don't have a chance to get access. So that's kind of what we're looking at from a business perspective, from an agriculture perspective, from a community perspective is, is looking at an overall backbone uh, for our 
for our area. So uh, that's kind of what we're, we're working on here. And hey, thanks, Mark. Um, I, I will tell you all that, that Yuma is a really unique situation. You've got, you've got a huge agriculture industry, you've got a decent sized community, and you've got a very large active border area, all requiring broadband. And just like we've seen in the other examples, uh, the key is to work together to come up with a solution that serves all these areas and not try to pick things off one at a time. So I'm very optimistic about Yuma and appreciate Mark's leadership in that area. Um, we're gonna go ahead and, and open things up to questions here. Um, Shamay, I don't know if you want to be the keeper of the uh, of the questions, but uh, as they come in, you're you're welcome to hop on and and, and read a question uh, to each of the gentlemen if if uh, if we've got one. Uh, I don't know. Maybe she's not hearing me. Um, let me take a look at the, uh, the question. Thing. I've actually got a question for Toby. Um, Toby, from, from the beginning, from the time that the, the idea of uh, Mojave Electric jumping into this business was introduced, how long did it take? Uh, and, and if I remember correctly, didn't Mojave Electric actually pull all their members and the, 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 the response was so overwhelming, it was kind of hard for them to say no? Yeah, yeah, Jeff, great question. They did, and it's been really kind of lightning speed when you think about how some other government programs work or you know, from A to Z sometimes, you're, you're looking at many, many years. Um, this really has just come up in the last few years. Um, just again, not to knock their competitors, but there's just been a desire to see better connectivity, less downtime. And um, you know, MEC being an electric cooperative and their board being our members, not all that different than elected officials stepped up and said, we're going to do it, applied for grants. They provided some great leadership with the city. And now they're going to invest $110 million into fiber to every home in the Bullhead City area. So it's, it's a fascinating process. I'll tell you a quick story, funny, not funny. Um, last Sunday, uh, as they prepared for some night work, um, they accidentally bumped a frontier line. Um, oh that took out fiber in the community for a little bit of time, and it just shows how reliant we are and their partners are. So Walmart, as an example, their registers weren't working. Some of the AT&T cell phones weren't working like they should have been. Uh, I mean, there's no end of how many things we all could say or we're reliant on now. We can't live without it, and I agree with the other presenters. We need more partnerships more opportunities to bring more broadband and fiber to our state. Good stuff, good stuff. Um, I don't know if we can unmute people or not what the process is for that. Shame if we have any other questions. If not, uh, I've actually got a, a question for Mark in, in Yuma. Um, I, I think it's important for, for folks to understand that this is a process and that, that if you have uh, pushback from different groups in your community that that's actually part of the process. Could you just give everyone an idea of just some of the different groups that are involved with the Yuma Broadband Action Team? Because there are a lot of different interests there and we're trying to come up with a solution to serve all of them. Uh, yeah, so in our Broadband Action Team, well, we started out, first we had to start out with just a, a agriculture and business group that worked to have our primary or uh, mobile carriers and and wire, the wireless carriers and the, uh, the cable carriers to upgrade their services. They upgraded theirs and then we moved on to uh, have a broadband team that includes the, the city of Yuma, city of Summerton, city of San Luis, city of Welton, Yuma County, uh, the school districts, and I, and I believe uh, an economic development and then of agriculture and business is represented on that. And as we move forward, looking at whole community uh, solutions, it, it becomes very difficult because uh, Yuma is spread out with those, all the different entities. And you run into problems with jurisdictional uh, authorities and ability to spend money outside of a city limit. So we're, we deal with some of those hurdles, trying to figure that out and uh, going into the unincorporated areas and how you end up trying to work with those different uh, 
jurisdictional limitations and funding and and how you put together a whole uh, service in the entire area. It's, it's critical that you ultimately figure out a solution for your entire community. Because if you just focus on certain parts of it, you just leave the other stranded. And as, as we move into this, this using broadband as your, as your basic core uh, function of how all business is going to operate, and you know, it's critical infrastructure. It's, it's no different water, power, sewer, roads, and law enforcement and, and EMS protection. And if you don't have it, you're not going to be able to function correctly. And, and 10 years ago, it was a luxury item. Today, it's critical infrastructure. And if you don't build a, your critical infrastructure correctly and robust and serve everyone, you end up with a situation like you did in Texas last week. You know, it turns into a mess. So we've seen it when critical infrastructure fails in this country and, and broadband is, is, is becoming more and more aware to everyone that it's, it's critical and, and it, it becomes how we fund it is, you know, we're all as communities gonna have to work that out, but it, you need to be able to serve everyone the same as you do with power and any other critical infrastructure. And I think we need to look at it like that. And, and so you, your ROI is not always going to be there. So as you look at your communities, as you're figuring this out, you need to plan on figuring a solution to serve everyone. There's other states that are working on that. And I think Jeff have, has information on that, whether it be Utah, Colorado, Montana, they're looking, they're looking at it as a whole solution pictures. And I think that's what we need to do in Arizona. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, we're, we're, we're actually looking very closely at Yuma and what they're doing in terms of uh, our plan. Um, there were, were several questions, unfortunately, we didn't get to in the um, uh, comments. Just one quick question. Somebody, David Plunkett, had asked regarding APS. APS just has chosen not to get into the retail broadband business, although they're a huge uh, provider of wholesale dark fiber to all the people we're talking about. So if you have APS in your community, that's a good thing. So... Uh, thank you so much, everyone on the panel. I truly appreciate the local insight. Uh, and now we're going to go ahead and turn it back over to Karen and the team at NTIA uh, to talk about our broadband planning roadmap. Actually, I'm going to tell you that Don Williams is here. He's um, double timing. He's covering a really important other meeting today. So I'm happy to introduce Don Williams from my team, who's um, popping in to tell you about our broadband planning roadmap, and he will also be our featured speaker next month, um, talking about um, going into much more depth on the roadmap. So um, Don, please take it away. Sure. Um, well, listen, thank you. Um, next slide. This last panel was absolutely fantastic. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get to listen to all of it, um, but I'm definitely going to be listening to the recording sometime soon. Um, you guys were very, very informative. Thanks. So um, I'm going to be talking about broadband planning uh, the next session. And I've been a part of many broadband plans, uh, some successful, a couple less so. And less so is also important lessons, as you all know. Um, so we're going to be looking at basically a roadmap, and we're going to be considering the importance of assembling a team. And a couple of my clients um, in the last two weeks have managed to assemble a broadband task force. So we're gonna talk about the composition of those task forces, a mix of skill levels, what we're looking for in, in a task force membership. Um, and that's actually you know, really the beginning of, of creating a, a good broadband plan going forward. We also want to look at, you know, what is the vision that the community has for broadband? And part of that is also going to involve a gap analysis of what you currently have versus what you think you need. So we're going to also be talking about research methods and how to determine some of these issues in terms of a gap analysis. Um, we're also going to be wanting to talk looking at all of the data sets that are possible, both socioeconomic, uh, business code data, um, all forms of data are gonna be useful for your broadband planning effort. Um, 
We also want to make sure we're engaging local stakeholders all along the way. Um, I'll be stressing that quite a bit. Uh, you want to bring the major stakeholders in your community uh, along with you. And it doesn't mean you have to engage every important stakeholder all the time, because frankly, you won't have time for that. Uh, but you will be engaging stakeholders throughout the planning process. And I will also mention right now that, you know, I, the planning process, you know, we're going to come to the end of a planning process. We have a document. I'm just here to tell you the planning process just continues on. It just takes a different format. Um, your goals become a little bit different. Um, but I think it will be um, quite, quite informative and we're looking forward to that. Uh, we also want to make sure we're looking at all of our possible technological options. Um, I think we're all agreed that fiber to the home, fiber to the premise, clearly a gold standard. Um, there are some communities that I've worked with, and I'm, I'm certain there are communities in, in Arizona, being a large rural state in many ways, um, where you know a fixed wireless system might be appropriate, uh, or a hybrid system where some of it is going to be fiber. Others are going to be uh, fixed wireless. Um, we're going to talk about some of those options as well in terms of hybrid systems. We're going to be talking about the organizational model for your, 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 uh, your broadband expansion or deployment plan. And, you know, that's going to run the gamut from private sector led uh, to some sort of public private partnership uh, to municipal uh, cooperative ownership as well. And a lot of that is going to be dependent on what your state law allows and what your local regulations allow. And that's going to be true both for the extent to which municipalities and local governments can be involved in telecommunications. It's also going to be dependent on uh, when you construct a public-private partnership for broadband, what does the state and, and your local uh, laws and regulations allow? for public-private partnership participation in broadband. Um, so selecting the organizational models, very important. We're gonna talk about some of the examples uh, we have. Um, and then finally, we're gonna talk about developing the actual project plan. Um, and that's gonna involve you know, the components of that plan. Uh, it's gonna involve the presentation of that plan. We're gonna talk about the needs for transparency throughout the process. Um, I'm looking forward to doing this. And I think that's coming up next month, correct, Karen? Yes, it is. Yeah, great. Um, and again, uh, thanks, Karen, for explaining why uh, I've been jumping on and on and off between different presentations and different time zones this morning and this afternoon. So um, again, thanks for having me today. And I look forward to talking with you next month. Cool. Next slide. Uh, we've updated our broadband planning uh, guide and um, kind of added a fork to it, which just indicates that the guide shifts a little bit if you're looking at infrastructure or inclusion. Um, Dawn is our expert on infrastructure and Amy Seng is our expert on inclusion. So we're going to have one session that has a little bit more of an infrastructure focus and another one with a focus on inclusion. The steps are really just the same. You're still going to look at um, uh, looking at uh, engaging partners, uh, a gap analysis, um, looking at your inventory analysis, evaluating solutions and funding, really all the same steps, but it's got a little bit different flavor when you're looking at infrastructure versus when you're looking at inclusion. And you kind of weave back and forth between the two of them. So next slide. And I'm going to hand it back to, actually, I think I'm going to hand it back to, I'm going to go one slide forward. And I'm going to hand it back to Cindy um, from EDA. Good morning. Thank you, Karen. Um, I just want to thank everybody. This has been uh, such a wealth of information for me. Uh, just to talk to you a little bit about myself and what EDA's role is in all of this, um, in case in case you don't know, 
Uh, you know, the EDA uh, is, a, is a relatively new federal agency, uh, but its sole mission is economic development, and that's pretty unique in the federal government. Um, as a result of COVID, uh, the EDA really ramped up its efforts to uh, work with economically distressed communities and uh, now has an economic development representative in every state. And really that's how I got to the state of Arizona, uh, not working from Seattle, but actually from Gilbert. So you have me full time in your state. And while I'm not authorized to travel just yet, I really look forward to meeting everyone. Uh, but in the six months that I've been here, uh, it's been very evident that economic development, sustainable economic development and broadband connectivity are inextricably linked if we, if we know that before, we certainly know that now. So it's really been an honor uh, getting to know Jeff and the Arizona Commerce Authority and my colleagues at NTIA. Um, and I really want to acknowledge my uh, colleague, Francis Sakaguchi, who's on the line right now. Um, but as our economic development integrator has really built up the network that allows all of us to be here with you today. And you know, much like we discussed, it's really gonna take a consortium of folks to put broadband plans together. It's gonna take a team of uh, resources such as ourselves and our agencies to, um, to help fund these, these projects. I think that we know that the scope and the magnitude of these projects is pretty much more than any one federal agency can take on. So it's really great uh, that Frances and, and her team has really understood that and allowed kind of all of us to get together and share this information with you today. And as we make our way through these workshops, we will start to talk about things like that. How do you put a funding package together? Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, hopefully these outcomes will make their way into solid grant applications um, for consideration by our investment review committee. And so that's, that's really why I'm so invested in, in the outcomes of these workshops and why I'm, I'm really here as a resource as well. So what I wanna talk about a little bit now is what happens you know, as we make our way through the workshops, I wanna talk about our technical assistance sessions. What you're hearing now in our workshops is, is just a whole lot of information that I know you're gonna process um, us but these technical assistance sessions are going to be really important for us to hear from you. What, what, is really, what are the broadband issues that they, as they relate to your community specifically? And how can we kind of fine tune our, um, our assistance to you? And so what we've decided to do every uh, uh, two weeks after each workshop, workshop session, we're going to be putting together a technical assistance session. And the first one is March 17th. Uh, and I believe we're gonna be putting the link for the registration in the chat pod. Um, but what you'll see up on the screen here is we've kind of taken the liberty of working uh, along the jurisdictional boundaries of our economic development districts, which you know are in close proximity <clears throat> to the COGS. We have four economic development districts as opposed to the six councils of, councils of government. But we've kind of done our best to kind of put everyone in the appropriate groupings because <clears throat> the conversations we feel are going to be specific to folks' individual locations. So we've kind of done our best to do that. You'll be getting information in terms of what group you belong in and, and here are the time slots. But I really don't want that to um, mean that if you can't make your time slot that you can't attend any of these sessions. So at the end of the day, please sign up for the time slot that is most convenient for you. Um, and without getting into too much detail, you know, what we're going to really do is have a series of worksheets that kind of draw out the conversation and kind of hopefully draw out what the issues are so we can, we can really engage in some good dialogue. And I know there's going to be a lot of great information sharing um, and at the end of the day, it's information that we need to know too. How do we best serve the state of Arizona when it comes to broadband connectivity? That's, that's really what we wanna really be together. And we wanna work very closely with the state and with our colleagues at NTIA to, to see how we can make that happen. So again, I wanna reinforce uh, that you can re register, register now and that you have to register for each session, whether it's for the workshop or the technical assistance session, that you've got to do that individually. So I don't really want to take up uh, too much of anyone's time. I know we've got some questions and answers, um, question and answer period. But again, I just wanted to, to really uh, make a pitch for these technical assistance sessions and also to pass it on to your colleagues. So you, know, you, you can attend these sessions 
um, without necessarily going to the workshops. So um, that's that's pretty much it for me. And I'll pass it back on to you, Jeff. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Cindy. I, I can't stress enough what a breath of fresh air Cindy has been to our state since moving here. Um, she is our advocate for the state of Arizona within the Economic Development Administration. Uh, Francis, who is on the, the phone as well, has also been a huge advocate for Arizona, uh, as did Steve Mosher at the USDA, who's, who's a co-sponsor of our event. So um, take these folks up on what they're saying, attend these sessions, ask the questions, understand their process, because ultimately uh, my personal goal of these seminars is to get as many communities as possible coached up to the level that we can apply for and win these federal and state grants. Um, I think we've got a great shot. There's a lot of funding out there, but as, as any organization, if we were startup founders pitching to venture capitalists, there is a function, there's a way that they do things. So it's important to ask the questions and make sure that you have the right organizations applying for the right kind of projects. Um, we heard things earlier, Mark Smith, for example, mentioned uh, the amount of uh, density and population on some of these grants. There are things like that, that if you know in advance, uh, you can craft your bid to, to be most effective. So I can't say enough how excited I am to have had this session with you. And I appreciate you taking two hours out of your day, uh, which is not a short period of time for any of us. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Karen for a quick closing. And, and if there's anything else that we can uh, help you with today. I'd just like to, again, thank you very much for joining us and um, remind you to sign up for the next session. Um, for anybody who didn't get their question answered and wants to stay and go off mute, um, we'd be happy to answer any questions that are remaining um, verbally or through the chat. Um, we know it's been a long two hours. We don't expect you to stay on, but our panelists and our speakers who are available will stay on if you have questions. We will hang out on the Zoom call um, if you want to sit with us and um, chat. So um, thank you all for joining us. We hope we'll see you for one hour workshops on March 17th. And we look forward to uh, our Brondag planning um, session um, on April, whatever it is. We'll see you later on. Thank you. We'll take a minute and let people uh, disappear. But for those people who have questions that didn't get answered, please stay a minute. And um, Shimei, um, anybody you can take off mute if they have a question, if you can take everybody off mute, um, well, well, we'll let people go so that uh, the shuffling dies down. But um, uh, then if uh, we'll give people a minute and if uh, people have questions, we can um, just chat for a second. They can also use the raise your hand feature. Oh, people are raising their hands. So you can, we can take them off mute. All right. All right, we have uh, Dominic, uh, I apologize if I butcher your name, uh, Pagliaccia, um, who I've unmuted. Yeah, hi, it's Dominic Pagliuk. I, I don't have a question at the moment. I can certainly stay to answer any that come up. This is uh, uh, in, in res with respect to APS and what we're doing. Well, great. Um, Dominic, let me see. There was a question in the Q&A thing. Let me see what it was. I was going to mention also Dominic and APS have been a fantastic partner from the get-go on this thing and um, continue to build out their network statewide. Uh, dark fiber went from, what, 24 fibers to 432 between Phoenix and Flagstaff. That is significant. So that's a good, good. Thank you, Dominic, for making yourself available. Sure. They thank are you, Jeff. a little bit different than your Small electric co-op, uh, it's a pretty big company. <laughs> Dominic, I'm just gonna read the question verbatim that is in the question box. Um, I'm not making any judgment on it. It says, can APS get the funding to build their own new company and obtain a grant like Mojave, Mojave Electric Co-op and get into the connectivity business? Yeah, so a lot there. Um, so I would say that at the moment, we're not looking for any grants. We are building out our communications backbone, uh, first and foremost, to improve the, the grid resiliency uh, for the Arizona grid. But in doing so, we're also, as Jeff mentioned, installing surplus capacity uh, to allow for that wholesale leasing 
of those assets to carriers who then can retail it as previously mentioned. So um, I think Mojave has the advantage of being a, in a local area and they can serve soup to nuts, um, uh, which is a great project. I mean, I would, uh, they would have more bandwidth than I have in Glendale, which is pretty cool. Um, but from our perspective, um, again, we're happy to help those carriers who can then serve those, uh, you know, those smaller communities. So um, I think as Jeff mentioned, we're, we're excited to support road broadband and uh, I think we're on our way and uh, you know, Flagstaff from our perspective will be completed here in May. Uh, so again, uh, working with various carriers on that um, to assist there and uh, continue our expansion. Um, what's your email so that I can put it in here? Uh, sure, it's dp, David Paul at aps.com. dp at? aps, applepetersam.com. You gotta be slow for me. Karen, he could be spelling his last name. I think you're getting off easy here. <laughs> at aps.com. Um, that was pretty quick. That's pretty short. It's good that it's not a not a hard one. DP at APS.com. Dominic responds that they are not looking for grant funding, but are expanding backbone. That was pretty quick. And I'm including your email as that response. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody else? Yes, we have one other person uh, that raised their hand. Um, it's Dwindlin Chester. Um, so... Um, if you would like to unmute, you're more than welcome to ask your question. Or make a comment. Or make a comment, yes. So, um, and then we also have some other questions in the chat. Um, uh, give me a second. Um, one of the questions um, was regarding cities conducting a gap analysis of what you have and what you lack, how would you, how would a city go about conducting this assessment? Um, after after um, Don's session, at, at our next session, Don's gonna give kind of a high level overview of what are the components of that. So our next session, Don will kind of give the framework of that. And then, um, uh, we'll provide kind of an outline for what are the elements that you'll look at to do a gap analysis. And then when we do the breakout session um, or the, the technical assistance session, that'll be an opportunity to do, to kind of workshop how you do the gap analysis. So the gap analysis for infrastructure, will look at things like um, towers, uh, rights of way, um, uh, buildings, um, uh, infrastructure kinds of things. Um, whereas the gap analysis uh, for digital inclusion looks more um, at programmatic things and, um, and, uh, uh, and we'll have a series of examples so that we'll get into a much more in-depth conversation. So um, we'll kind of have some guides that will lead us through that conversation. So we kind of have some handouts that work through that. So the reason that we have the breakout sessions are so that we can have those kind of smaller conversations um, so that you can kind of work through that more at a community level. So if you're interested in that, um, do go to ne our next session, the April session, and then go to that breakout session so that you can kind of have that more local conversation about it. Does that answer the question? Or does it lead you closer to the answer? <laughs> um, yes, so it does. Yes, thank you. And the next question I have, or I actually have uh, Chris uh, Pastores um, on as well, who'd like to ask a question. Thank you. This is Chris Pastors from Coconino County. And I, I, I want to say thank to, thanks to everyone. But my question really has to do with We've got such a big, vast expanse in Arizona, and no one seems to have a good coverage map or a good planning map of what projects are coming up. And I was wondering, is there a place where we can get a, an accurate coverage map, or when would we be able to expect to see one of these being developed? I understand that Broadband USA has one for, for policymakers, 
but boots on the ground, it's really hard to dig into it when you can't see it. Um, and so that was my question about a, a visual coverage map or even a planning map for what projects are, uh, are coming online. Uh, when could we expect to see one? Where would we go to see one? Um, am I just uh, pipe dreaming? <laughs> Thank you very much. Jeff, that one's yours. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, again, with with Coconino County, you're, you're I'll, I'll first I'll address the, just the size of the county. Number one, uh, we did give a grant to the county, um, and uh, your CIO has done a fantastic job of putting together a uh, a pretty detailed plan for middle mile construction in the county. Um, there's an excellent website. Um, I don't have it in front of me right now, but uh, that details not just the different routes, the different folks that are involved. So Coconino County, by and large, is pretty far along on this process. Um, the challenge that you have uh, is that, you know, I'm telling you this as a guy that worked at AT&T for quite a while, a lot of this stuff they, they don't want to disclose and they don't legally have to. Uh, there's things that involve with the DOD and Homeland Security that quite honestly, they don't want folks to know where those lines are running. Um, we do meet with the carriers, uh, for example, and, and just try to understand the projects. I know there's a company called Arcadian Infracom uh, that's, that's considering building up in Coconino County. I know they've worked with the Navajo Nation pretty extensively. And this is the kind of thing that we communicate uh, to your CIO and others about, about what's going on up there. Ultimately, the counties and, and the communities have to make the decisions that are best for them when it comes to broadband. We want you to coordinate with the state, but the last thing I want is to give the impression that we're sitting here in Phoenix telling you all what plan and what technology and how to do it. Um, we're going to put together a statewide uh, connectivity grid, if you will, but once you get into those communities, I know I've had great discussions with the city of Flagstaff about what's, what they're looking to do with their business loops and that sort of thing. So there's going to be a lot of different options. Um, I, would, I would just continue to, to work within the Coconino County Broadband Action Team, um, and if there are any specific questions, if you need to talk to uh, AT&T or, or Zayo or somebody to understand where they're at in Coconino County, I'll be more than happy to arrange those meetings. Uh, it may, they may ask you to sign a non-disclosure, but uh, unfortunately that's the process. As far as the federal stuff goes, I'll let Karen to speak to the timing on the, the national map because that's a whole different mm -hmm. process. Um, so uh, now I'll do my answer, a little different. Do we have a MOU with, with you or uh, not? We're working on that right now. Okay. So I have kind of two answers. Um, we do have a national broadband availability map that we're working on and um, we require a memo of understanding with each state. So once that memo of understanding is developed, um, then we'll leverage your local data. We do have some proprietary data sets and some of those proprietary data sets include excellent UCLA, UCLA data, which I see um, has been put in the chat as um, which includes um, very granular data from UCLA, uh, as well as MLAB speed test data and some proprietary data sets from some of the carriers. Um, and we also have data from um, some of the deployment programs from the FCC and from um, USDA about things that have already been funded. Um, because the point is to use it to make better investment decisions. Because some of the data is proprietary, um, we can't make it publicly available. However, we can give the data to our partner, Jeff, who can share what he chooses to with you. So once that MO M MOU is done, Jeff will have access and can use it in his planning work with people like you. Um, uh, in ways that he feels works. So we're kind of in progress there. And I think that that's gonna be a useful tool in your work. So that's kind of, we're going down that road and I think it's gonna be useful to you. And I've got to tell you the maps that I've seen there are quite helpful. The second answer is that uh, one of our sessions is a, a data workshop. And I think that's the fourth one. And that's the one that I do. And, um, you know, it's not a panacea, uh, but it's pretty helpful uh, in terms of um, 
how you can use some of the publicly available data out there and kind of wring the best value out of it um, to actually understand um, uh, and use it effectively. So um, one of the things that I focus on is not just the data, but using multiple data sources together and using uh, a range of different tools to get access to the data and to compare different data sources rather than taking any one of them at face value and then adding your own local community insights to make the data tells a, tell the story that you know is true in your community. And so um, I, I think that you will find that an effective workshop as part of your own story. So one of the things that I was on a program yesterday with a number of different carriers and Jonathan Chambers, who is one of the people I think is kind of brilliant. He said, you know, don't wait for any map, you know, just get going. And I think I will tell you that if you go come to my data workshop, don't wait for any map. I can give you enough information in my data workshop with the data that's right there that you can make your broadband plan right now. So we've, uh, I put a link in there to the Coconino County website uh, that, that Matt Fowler, your CIO, uh, led and put together with our, our planning grant. That's a good place to start. Uh, again, we're excited to work with Coconino County. There is a lot going on up there uh, with the 17 build, the APS build, the I-40 build. Uh, we've had several data center companies talk about the Flagstaff area, so we're very excited. Um, we're getting to the point in the, the day where I know I'm getting a little bit hungry and I'm, I'm sure everybody else is, so. We're gonna go ahead and wrap things up for the day. And I appreciate everyone's time. Karen, thank you. Cindy, everybody from the federal government. Shimei and the team at the uh, ACA, thank you for the technical assistance behind the scenes. Not my strength and I do appreciate it. And uh, please do register for the session on the 17th uh, and the session for next month. Thanks. Thank you all. Take care. We'll all the questions eventually. Okay, bye-bye.